All right, I have a little secret for you, okay? Now listen closely because this is important. Christians tend to change the Bible. Like a lot. Now by this, of course, I don't mean they actually take a pen and edit the words of Scripture. You know, for the most part, they think that would be bad. But they do face a challenge, which is that a lot of the Bible isn't as wise as they think it is and doesn't contain as much of a consistent through line as they think it does. So to deal with this, they just kind of conceptualize it and retell it, in a lot of places anyway, in ways that are totally different than the actual pages on Scripture. Now, just our luck, there's a really popular Christian YouTube channel called Bible Project that shows an example of how that's done by changing one of the stories Christians like to change the most, which is the Garden of Eden story. So let's watch that. Now, before we get started, I'm not much into self-promotion and all that, but please remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and all that stuff that YouTubers should tell you to do, and I usually forget to tell you. Also, if you'd like to check out my Patreon, I'm going to be starting a live stream for patrons only. I'm going to shoot for maybe about every month or so. It's going to be a really low-key thing, not very formal, but I'll hang out, maybe react to something, answer some of your questions, and stuff like that. Again, I'm going to try to shoot for every month. It's not a guaranteed thing but I want to do something to reward patrons. I've already announced it on my Patreon site, but if you want to go over there and have a look, if you can afford it, please don't you know, support me if you can't afford it. That would be great, and it gives us a little bit more of a chance to interact. That said, here's the video. The story of the Bible begins in a garden where God and humans live together. And the biblical authors want us to see this garden as a type of temple. The top is the most sacred place, the Holy of Holies, where God's presence is most intense. So all we've gotten so far is just a really basic description of the Garden of Eden, and even then we're already pretty far off track. For one, Genesis never describes God and humans living together in the garden. You know, God might pop by from time to time, but he doesn't really seem to dwell there. And the fact that um, Genesis 2.18 describes Adam as being alone and that being a problem at least hints that God's not there with them all the time. Also, there's just absolutely no portrayal of the Garden of Eden as being any kind of temple or of part of it being the Holy of Holies. Just kind of wacky, made-up sounding nonsense. And that's where we find the Tree of Life. So, what's this tree all about? Well, it represents God's own life and creative power that is made available to others. In fact, God's first command is that humans eat from all of the trees, including this one. And now we get to the tree of life. Again, they are way off track and there is a lot coming at us here. The tree is just labeled as the tree of life in Genesis 2.9 and Genesis 3.22 says that humans will live forever if they eat from it. There's nothing at all about it being God's life and certainly nothing about his creative power coming from it. I don't know. And did God command them to eat from it? Well, you can maybe take something close to that meaning from chapter 2, verses 16 to 17, where God says they can eat from any tree they want, but not from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So technically, this doesn't have God forbidding them from eating from the tree of life, which I actually found pretty interesting. As many times as I'd read Genesis, I never really caught that he forbade them from eating from one tree, but not the other. So I find it kind of funny that in a way, them saying that God commanded them to eat from the tree of life is maybe a little more tenable than I thought. But while it's tenable, it's also a little tenuous. Ha ha! God didn't command them to eat from all the trees. He just said eat whatever you want and only excluded the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's not the same as saying to eat them all. Like, was God going to get mad if he came by and they hadn't eaten any lemons? Like, two totally different meanings, right? In fact, the only time God explicitly talks about people eating from the tree of life is in Genesis 3.22 when he freaks out because you know, he didn't want them to do it. So its exclusion from the list of trees in Genesis 2 seems more like a sloppy admission than a command to use it as his tool to drip feed his knowledge and power into them, which it wasn't anyway. It was just a tree that instantly granted immortality. That's not at all what they're describing. Now there's one other detail in here that in their audio anyway, they mention kind of casually, so you might have missed it unless you're actually watching the video closely. And that's that they say that the tree of life is at the top of the garden. Not so much emphasized in their script, 
but it's emphasized very much in their animation. They show this big, huge hill, and then they show the Tree of Life being up top there like some kind of giant avatar tree. And this kind of serves their point about God feeding his power down into it and of that being some holy of holies and all this stuff. But none of this is in Genesis at all. Genesis simply describes both the Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge as being in the middle of the garden, or I think in the more literal translations like the King James and the New American Standard, in the midst of the garden. So this whole thing simply isn't there. Now to be clear, this is important. It can sound like I'm just kind of well actualing their script and nitpicking and everything, but they emphasize this a lot in their visuals, and as you, this video goes on, you're going to see that they're creating this entire different mythology around the Tree of Life than is ever presented in Scripture. This not only entirely changes the meaning of what the Tree of Life is in the Garden of Eden, but it creates this entire new through line throughout the Bible and Christian theology that they just simply made up. So you're ingesting God's own life. That sounds intense. It also sounds like something you just made up because the text doesn't say anything like that. Yeah, this meal transforms the one who eats it, or in the words of the story, it leads to eternal life. This is kind of true in that the fruit makes you immortal, but calling it a transformation that leads to eternal life is definitely trying to tack some New Testament connotations onto it. Okay, but on the way to the tree of life, the humans have to pass by another tree called the tree of knowing good and bad. And God says that eating from this tree will kill you. Again, totally not true. The Bible just says the two trees are in or near the middle of the garden. There's nothing about needing to walk past the tree of knowledge of good and evil on your way up a hill to the tree of life. Hell, Genesis 3.3 has Eve identifying the tree of knowledge of good and evil as a tree in the middle of the garden. So if anything, you're just going to kind of walk up to both of them together. Like seriously, all this stuff is just so brazenly invented, it's kind of mind-blowing to me. Like these guys are Bible-believing Christians, right? In fact, just out of curiosity, I looked up their about page just to check it out and see what they're about, and here's what I found. Bible Project is a nonprofit, crowdfunded organization that produces 100% free Bible videos, podcasts, articles, classes, and educational Bible resources to help make the Bible story accessible to everyone everywhere. So I guess this is supposed to be recreating the actual story of the Bible. From page one to the final word, we believe the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. It's not coming out and saying it, but this does make them sound a little bit like Bible literalists, right? You know, it's all supposed to be the truth of the Bible. The diverse collection of ancient books overflows with wisdom for our modern world. As we let the Bible speak for itself, ahem, ahem, we believe the message of Jesus will transform individuals and entire communities. So I don't know, it sounds like they're supposed to be making the actual Bible come alive with animations and stuff, but I'm seeing very little letting the Bible speak for itself. How does it do that? Well, it represents taking the authority to do what is good in your own eyes. And when humans do that, it leads to broken relationships, violence, and death. Okay, so now I think we're starting to see what they're getting at with all these little changes to Genesis. Like I said at the beginning, they want to see the Bible as having more wisdom than it actually does. To do this, they take a few of the bare bones elements of the Genesis story and use them to weave their own story about God just trying to protect us from ourselves. See, he just wanted to save us from the consequences of our own actions. As limited creatures, we're bound to destroy ourselves if left to our own devices. So he was just trying to set us along a better path, that's all. You know, he was like a parent telling us not to run out into traffic or play with the chemicals under the sink. That's it. Isn't that reasonable? You know, all God wanted from Adam and Eve is that they listened to him so that they wouldn't wander astray and hurt themselves. That's why he told them not to eat from the tree. It wasn't like some <laughs> stupid story about magic fruit that would kill you if you eat it. It wasn't him just threatening them because he wanted obedience. It was all for their own good. Now, Bible Project doesn't explicitly say all this, but it does seem to be what they're going for. And they do describe the death that comes from eating the fruit as an eventual death that, you know, naturally comes from our behavior getting out of control if we fall prey to our own behavior. They describe it all as a progression. Once we take from the fruit, then we go our own way, and as a result, relationships fall apart, we become violent, and people die, you know, implicitly because we're killing each other or ourselves with our own bad actions. And God's just trying to stop that. But that's not what the story depicts, like, not at all. Like, for one thing, you know, just none of that's in there. But for another, the death is described as being kind of immediate, as if the fruit is some kind of poison. 
The NIV has God saying they die when they ate that fruit, and the King James and NASB are a little more literal about saying that they would die that same day, and this language appears to be in the Hebrew as well. In fact, the Bible says this so clearly that apologists sometimes try to explain this by saying that God killed the animal in their place that was used to make the skins for their new clothes. So there's something there that they see the need to reconcile. But Genesis only shows three things happening as a result of them eating the fruit. The only direct result is that they now had knowledge of good and evil, so the fruit did what it was supposed to. Then we have two reactions from God. First, he just gets mad because they disobeyed, and he punishes them by making life suck in the way it would have sucked if you lived in the ancient world, which just makes this sound like a mythical explanation for you know why people go through the hardships they go through over the course of their natural day. Second, he freaked out because once they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then they might eat from the tree of life and become like the gods. In fact, this concerned him so much that that's why he actually sent them out of the garden. Seriously, this is all explicitly stated in Genesis 3, 22-24. It's as if there were two things that differentiated gods from humans, two steps humans could take to becoming like the gods. One was getting knowledge of good and evil, and the other was becoming immortal. I'm kind of reading between the lines with that progression, but it's at least strongly implied by the story. At the very least, what God was upset about was, number one, maybe that they didn't listen, and number two, that they might become immortal and become like the gods. That's in the text. This is purely a story of humans gaining power through magic fruit and God responding out of fear about what might happen next. There's nothing about us straying from God's guidance, of him showing concern for that, or of him having any concern for the well-being of humanity at all. So in light of this, it's pretty obvious why these Bible Project guys might want to reinvent the story, right? They're modern 21st century people with modern sensibilities, and they at least have some sense of what behavior is and how it works. I'm not saying a great sense, but at least they have the sense to know that when you do things, your behavior has consequences, and that it all doesn't come from or be affected by magical objects like fruit. They know that, and so this story, and everything it's about both literally and thematically, is totally inadequate for them, so they tell it as something completely different. Now, this kind of turd polishing is really common for Christians. They see this in the Bible, and it's either stupid or kind of nonsensical or cruel, and so they take it to mean this. This takes a remarkable amount of brain power, and it's kind of sad that it's all wasted, you know? Like, cure cancer or invent an apple without a core or something like that. You know, do something other than just try to elevate this book that you deep down don't seem to have much respect for and try to make it fit your modern sensibilities just because you want to believe that it's the absolute word of God. And so here's the thing. Both trees look beautiful, but one of them is a false tree of life. No, not a false tree of life. An actual tree of knowledge of good and evil. Seriously, guys, have some respect for what the Bible actually says. And the humans take from this false tree of life. And they're exiled from the garden for good. Which raises the question, can anyone ever get back to the tree of life? Well, not if God has anything to do with it. I mean, he posted angels and a flaming sword to keep people from getting in there and getting to it, right? You know, because it's a magic tree that grants immortality and he didn't want people to eat from it, and not something that's meant to drip feed us his essence and power. Well, later on in the story, we meet a man named Moses, and he encounters God in a desert tree on top of a mountain. Okay, seriously, is he about to suggest the burning bush is another tree of life or something? Oh, you mean the burning bush, where Moses is told that he's standing on holy ground? Yeah, it's a plant on a mountain radiating with God's life and power, just like the tree of life. All right, God spoke through the bush and told him the ground was holy. That was it. And God tells Moses, bring your people up to this mountain so we can form a partnership. Okay, editing bay prophet is out here. I forgot to mention this originally, but God never said he was going to bring them up the mountain to form a partnership. 
He just told Moses that after he freed Israel, they'd worship him on that mountain, and that them doing that was supposed to be a sign that God had sent him? Which doesn't even make a lot of sense to me. Like, here, I brought you to the top of a mountain, now do you believe I'm the messenger of God? <laughs> Whatever. This is the kind of stuff that makes the Bible sound like scraps of lines that ancient people just kind of tried weaving together. Besides, they never all went up the mountain anyway. It gets a little complicated because Exodus isn't exactly known for its coherent narrative and also the mountain seems to change names between Horeb and Sinai, but when they come back they just camp at the base of the mountain. Only Moses goes up and God declares that anybody else who tries to go up there will die, so it doesn't exactly sound like God's inviting people back up to draw his power from a new tree of life. Also contradicts God's statement in Exodus 3, but who has time to track down all the things the Bible gets wrong, right? And this partnership will force them to make a choice. Will they follow gods of their own making or receive life from the true God? And in this story, they give their allegiance to an idol. So I guess on a purely literal level, they got most of the events right here. Moses went up the mountain and while he was there, they built a calf. So yeah, they created an idol at that point. But the entire narrative they're making is just completely made up. This wasn't something where God brought them there to establish their allegiance to him, and then they failed by making an idol. Moses was just gone getting commandments for too long, and it just portrays them as being a little nervous because they're there without their leader and making a calf. They're reading a ton into this. Now, does this parallel Genesis 3 at all? I guess in the incredibly broad sense that God said to do something and people didn't and he got mad. By the way, God was so mad he was going to kill them all until Moses talked him out of it. Largely by reminding him of his promise to Abraham and telling him how silly he'd look if he did it. Doesn't exactly sound like the modern Christian idea of a transcendent God, does it? And it's just the first of many. The story goes on to show generation after generation choosing gods of their own making. And these idols were usually placed on tall hills like beautiful trees. But they're false trees of life that lead the people into self-destruction, exile, and death. Okay, I think you're starting to see what's going on here, right? These guys have been immersed in the Bible for a long time, and they've started to develop some fan theories about it. And when they pick and choose through the Bible enough, when they stare at their theories long enough, they start to see an artificial thematic thread running through the text. I mean, they probably didn't invent this all themselves. They probably inherited a lot of it from various Christian traditions and from people around them. But basically what they're doing is the same thing that a thousand other channels do, talking about how they think they've unlocked the secret meaning of their favorite movie, uh, what the author really intended. It's really kind of silly. The trick, though, is that while those things just think they've figured out an author's intention, these people are thinking that they're unlocking the actual intentions and will of a god, so it's a little more consequential. But yes, the Bible does describe idols as being up on high places, basically probably on top of hills. Now, maybe this is just, you know, where you'd put that kind of thing if you want people to see it. Or maybe it's because they're false trees of life. I guess just pick whichever one sounds better to you based on whether you want to just take the obvious answer at face value or go down a rabbit hole with your favorite fan theory. Now remember when I said that Bible Project was trying to invent some thematic through line running throughout the entire Bible when they said the tree of life was up on a hill? Well here's where they try to tie it all together. They want the burning bush to be a secondary tree of life and they want idols to be false trees of life. This would not only create thematic unity throughout the Bible that you know isn't there, but it would turn the tree of life from a random immortality granting object to part of this whole thing about people choosing the real life of God versus the false life of doing their own thing. You know, it just creates a lot of meaning that's not there. So they pick and choose these scenes throughout the Bible where people have some encounter with God or do the wrong thing or something like that, and they look for things that are similar to the tree of life. So the bush, the idols, all those things, they're all maybe tree ish. And if they're on a mountain or a high place or whatever, then they're up high. And so it all comes together. They see all these webs of meaning. Problem is, the tree of life was not up a hill. So they just had to purely invent that. That makes this part just a little clumsy, right? Um, now, they did one thing a little clever. They slipped this through in the beginning before you saw what they were doing. They fudged a little bit on this tiny detail which is the suggestion that the tree of life was up high on a hill before you really knew where they were going. 
If they could get that by you when it's just some casual little detail in the story, you might take it for granted. And then when you see all these other things, you just say, oh, wow, they're really onto something here. I don't know. Uh, it's a little bit clever. But the fact that you need to fudge a detail to make your fan theory work, it just seems a little lazy and stupid. It's like death's grip on us is too strong to resist. Is there any hope? Well, let's turn now to the story of Jesus. He came to announce that God's eternal life was available once again through him. Oh my gosh, the cross is going to be the next tree of life up a hill, isn't it? So Jesus thinks of himself as the tree of life. Yes, this is what he meant when he claimed to be the vine that brings God's life into the world. And Jesus invited people to eat from him. Yeah, he was inviting people to trust him and be transformed by his life. Again, okay thematic connection, I guess. But Jesus was just using the metaphor of the vine to say that people had to be connected to him to be of any use. You know, the way a cult leader would. And yeah, I'll admit that his life and teachings are supposed to transform people. But this doesn't mean that he's the tree of life and that people are supposed to eat off of him. That tree is still in the garden being guarded by angels. And why is that again? Oh yeah, because God doesn't want people eating off of it. So I don't think he's exactly sending Jesus to grant people the immortality he was afraid they would take from the tree of life. If he wanted them to start doing that, he could just remove the angels from the garden and let people go in there and take it, right? This is where we start to see a core problem arise. The story of Jesus and the story of the Garden of Eden are just very different mythologies. They operate on very different ground rules about the nature of the supernatural and depict a different God with different concerns and vulnerabilities. We can see this by trying to picture the tree of life, strictly as depicted in Genesis, existing in the same universe as Jesus. On one hand, you have God's Son sent to earth to die so that we could have eternal life, and on the other, you have a tree that could immediately grant immortality, apparently irreversibly, with or without God's consent, and God's so nervous about the situation that he sent them away from that tree and made sure they could never get back to it. So I guess it's fine to think, wow, the tree grants eternal life and so does Jesus if you want to find some thin thematic through line in a work of literature. But trying to put them together in a unified body of, you know, theologically consistent literal reality, that gets a little hairy. But Jesus also exposed how corrupt humans are, how much they love false trees of life. And so Jesus presented people with a new choice between life or death. And this time, they don't just choose death. They also chose to attack the one who sustains all of life. Yes, Jesus is led up to the top of a hill where he dies upon a tree. The cross is the sad and violent result of humanity's desire to do what is good in our own eyes. The tree of life has been overcome by the power of death. This is a weird take in light of most Christian theology. They depict Jesus' death on the cross as this kind of spontaneous act of human rebellion. Like Jesus came down to give them the fruit of life and they said no and not only that but killed him too. And then they call his death like the sad consequence as a result. This doesn't make sense because Jesus' death was the plan all along. You know, humans were used in that plan. They were almost like tools of God to sacrifice his own son. But his death was the plan. In fact, if you want to see some figurative fruit of life coming from this, that fruit was born by them killing him. So, I don't know, it's kind of weird. And I guess one thing about this is most of these changes to the Bible would go down pretty easy for Christians. In fact, most Christians do a lot of these reinterpretations themselves. But looking at Jesus' sacrifice this way, I could see some getting offended by that. Even though I guess maybe most of their viewers won't think about this hard enough to really see that it's a problem. I think they see some sentiment about Jesus' death and how sad it was and just kind of think, oh yeah, that's terrible. And don't really go through all the theological implications. Well, it seemed that way. But Jesus said that he was a seed of God's life that would die in the ground, but then grow into a plant that would bear much fruit. So when I first heard this, I thought that seemed this way meant that they had the sense to walk back their narrative about Jesus' death being an act of human rebellion. But I guess not. The narrative is just as clearly there. They're just saying that Jesus made a comeback after humans, you know, turned on him and killed him. So to defeat death, Jesus went through it. And now, this new tree of life stands before us all, 
We can eat from it, but it will mean passing through death like Jesus, allowing our old way of being human to die. So that a new humanity can grow in its place. Yes, Jesus said he is the vine and we are his branches. So not only do you eat from this tree, you're invited to become a part of it, helping produce its fruit so that his life and love can spread through us to others. <sighs> okay. I guess this is fine, but this is all starting to get a little exasperating. Like at its core, what they just said could sound like a very naturalistic view of Jesus' teachings. He gave us a positive message, and as we internalize and live according to that message, our old selves die and new selves arise in its place, which basically is just a way of saying we change our habits, you know? Uh, he just gave us good advice, and we become new people in a way as we are transformed by it. Then we spread that same word to others, they live according to it too, and the world becomes a better place. And I guess in a way that spreads life. So great for what it is, assuming you think that Jesus' teachings are all uniquely good and true and everything. But the problem is that most of it is shrouded in metaphor. Are we literally eating from a tree of life? Obviously not. Are we literally passing through death? No. Are we part of a literal vine and is fruit growing from us? I'd hope not, and if that's happening to you, I would suggest you see a doctor. So since these statements are so obviously symbolic, they give Christians room to create all the meaning in their heads. Eating from the tree of life could be seen as making a conscious decision to follow Jesus' teachings so that your decisions naturally promote human flourishing and thus life, or it could mean that some kind of supernatural life force enters you when you accept Jesus. Being part of the vine and producing fruit could just be accepting Jesus' teachings and applying them to your life so that you do good things, or it could be seen as drawing actual power from the Holy Spirit. The only metaphor that's clarified at all is passing through death, which is described as allowing our old way of being human to die, but even that language is ambiguous. Is it referring to personal growth based on natural decision making, or is it suggesting that there is actually some ethereal essence inside us that needs to you know, fade away before we can be filled by some better ethereal essence from somewhere else. That's the frustrating thing about this. It's hard to nail down what these guys are saying because their language is so slippery, which is what lets Christians take so much varied meaning from it. So how do you even criticize it? How do you analyze anything about it except pointing out this one specific fact, which is, it means so many different possible things. Basically, it operates on the level of a deepity. Most of what it says has a trivial meaning, referring at best to a mundane generality about something like self-improvement, and then a meaning that, if not evidently false, is considered so fanciful that most people don't take it seriously, such as statements about behavior being caused by magical forces or having magical consequences. By using language that straddles these interpretations, it allows believers to adopt some vague sense of the supernatural without disavowing their naturalistic understanding of how the world works or getting pinned down with questions about how the supernatural works in any way in any situation. Basically, best of both worlds. And so the story of the Bible ends in a new garden, which is also a kind of temple, with the tree of life at its center, providing healing and life forever to all who choose to eat from it. So here's a challenge for you. Tell me what end of the Bible story they're referring to. Is it now when it brings us up to the present day? Is it in the future where everyone goes to heaven? Or is it something else entirely? It's hard to tell, right? I mean, you could probably argue one way or the other, but therein lies the problem. It could be any time, place, or event because the tree and the garden are being used so metaphorically, so far removed from their original mythological context, that they've lost any specific meaning. Now this is handy for Christians because it turns the tree of life into this malleable thing that you can see behind any good thing that happens. Every bit of luck, every blessing, every cherry-picked example of Christianity doing something good, that was just God passing his goodness through the tree of life. And I guess if anything bad happens or Christians misbehave, then you know, people are people or maybe they picked from the bad tree of life or a false tree of life or something. It means literally nothing. It's just a way of interpreting the natural world. And that's what makes this really handy. If you're a Christian and you want to believe in the supernatural or in miracles, you're clearly not living in a world where they happen. 
So you can just see natural events as being miracles if you fuzzy the words enough. That's one good thing that this does for Christians. But it also makes the original story sound less stupid. If the tree of life is this metaphorical now, then maybe it was just a little metaphorical back then. I mean, if you're a fundamentalist, you'll still believe the story literally happened, but at least this shifts the story away from the magical effects of eating fruit and towards something more intelligible about the natural consequences of actions and obedience and disobedience and stuff like that. At this point, the biggest supernatural concept you're stuck with in the story is original sin, but that's such a vague, faraway kind of magic, it doesn't really impact your thinking in the same way, or it doesn't seem as silly. You know, it could almost be a representation or platonic ideal for, you know, transgressions or feeling of guilt and stuff like that. It's a lot different than thinking that somebody actually plucked a piece of fruit and ate it and that's why we know good from evil, or that they might have plucked another fruit and eaten it and then we would have all been immortal. So basically this video is Bible Project's way of neutering a story from Genesis to one, incorporate it into a thread that runs throughout the entire Bible, and two, make it more palatable for modern Christians. And they're not the only ones that do this, like not by a long shot. I mean, show me a Christian who doesn't think that the serpent is the devil, that Adam and Eve suffered a spiritual or eventual death, that God sent them out of the garden because they were now stained with original sin and maybe had to leave his presence, or at least something like those, right? Absolutely none of that is in or even implied by the original story. But Christians kind of have to see it there because the actual thing is so obviously primitive and, you know, also kind of messes with the theology. Basically, if you take the beginning of Genesis for what it is, it sounds like any other form of crude mythology from the ancient world trying to explain everything from why work is hard to why snakes don't have legs. That's why early Christians going back to the New Testament have been working so hard to retcon this story and why the story continues to evolve to this day. Because in reality, the core problem is there are only three things you can do with this story. One, take the actual story at face value, and that's just too ridiculous even for most Christians. Two, read the story as a myth full of interesting but non-literal symbols, and that's unacceptable for biblical literalists. Or three, squint your eyes really hard and try to see the story as drastically different than what actually happened in Genesis. The fact that Christianity has to disrespect the source material by choosing number three says a lot about it and its relationship with its Bible. Now, I'm not sure whether Bible Project did this in a uniquely weird way, or whether it just seems weird to me because it's so different from the ways I and my church reinvented the Bible when I was a Christian. Either way, though, it's a pretty telling example. This program was made possible by a grant from John Adams, Bob Generic, Maggie Danger, S.R. Foxley, Daniel Bostet, Magnus Holmgren, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.